Welcome back to my review of every Pokemon anime series. In this video, we're going over the third anime series, Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. This series is often stated to be one of the best in the entire Pokemon anime. However, there are some who believe that Diamond and Pearl isn't as great as it's said to be and have some pretty valid criticisms. Well, which one is it? Is it really one of the best or is it just a rinse and repeat of the Advanced series? Well, after rewatching every single episode, I'm finally ready to give my thoughts. But because I'm a huge DP stan, I'm gonna need some help to make this review a little more fair. So joining me are my friends Animated Ginger and Age of Trades. What's up Ginger Cornets? It's your favorite Animated Ginger here. Hey everyone, this is Age of Trades, aka Polly from the Pokepod. As always, we'll be dissecting the good, the bad, and then wrapping things up with the final verdict. Now with that out of the way, let's get started with our retrospective review of the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl anime. Just like the Advanced series, one of the greatest things about Diamond and Pearl is Ash's experience. After conquering the Battle Frontier, Ash was in an all-time high as a trainer, so how could they continue to make him improve? Well, what really makes Ash stand out in Diamond and Pearl is not only his willingness to learn from everyone, but also his newfound focus on strategy. A big part of Ash's character arc in Hoenn is overcoming his overconfidence. He was cocky back then and really didn't like to take advice from others. But after getting his fair share of slices of humble pie, in Sinnoh, Ash is way more open to learning from others regardless of whether or not he's better than them. Because of this, Ash not only continued to teach his Pokemon new moves, but also came up with amazing battle strategies that were inspired by other trainers he's met along the way. Let's run through the list. The earliest example of this is the spin dodge that he learned from Dawn. Not only did it play a key role in helping Ash defeat Rourke, but it was something that he continued to use for the rest of the series. Then there's the Heart Home Tag Battle, where Ash is able to save Chimchar from a surf attack by remembering Zoe's contest performance the episode prior. In the battle against Reggie, he's really impressed with Turtwig's speedy dodge and Razor Leaf combo, a strategy Ash picked up from Gardenia's Turtwig. Then there's the mastery of Dawn's Ice Aqua Jet in the Wallace Cup, the famous counter shield Ash learns from watching Dawn's contest as well, the new battle style his grotto learned from Pulse Torterra, and even learning to read the wind thanks to the Air Battle Master. All these minor things he picked up from other people throughout his journey really came in handy and just show how much Ash is adapting and learning. Another thing Ash learns in this series is to recognize his Pokemon's battle styles. Not every Pokemon will battle the same and that's something that trainers gotta adapt to in order to bring out their Pokemon's true potential. And this is the first series to really focus on that. We see this with Ash's Apom when he realizes that it's more suited for contests and trades it for Dawn's Buizel, with Grottle after evolving and realizing it needs a whole new battle style, and even with Gliscor when Ash realizes that leaving it with the Air Battle Master would help improve its battle style in the long run. All of these examples show Ash's growth and maturity as a Pokemon trainer, and it adds a great new layer of depth to the experience he's already accumulated in the past two series. And now for our next main character. Similar to the first episode of the Advanced Generation series, the first episode of Diamond and Pearl is all about introducing a new protagonist. We actually don't even see Ash until the very end of the first episode. Its focus is entirely on Dawn. Right from the start, we see that Dawn has a clear goal, wanting to be a top coordinator just like her mother, Joanna. We also get to see Dawn save an overly confident Piplup from an Ariados before choosing him as her partner. So right off the bat, it's clear that she has a good heart. However, Piplup isn't the only overconfident one here, as it isn't long before Dawn's faults start becoming apparent, specifically at her first ever contest in Jubilife City. Now for a first-timer, Dawn actually does pretty well, making it all the way to the semi-finals. But after losing to Zoe, she calls her mother and begins to break down. Joanna pretty sternly explained to Dawn that instead of feeling sad over the loss, a better choice of action would be to figure out what went wrong and fix it for next time. She even mentions that Dawn doesn't need to be calling her for support, and that her friends and Pokemon can provide that assistance. Now at face value, a mother telling her 10-year-old child to stop calling her sounds kinda messed up, but there's actually a really good reason behind this. Joanna knows that Dawn was overconfident going into this contest, and much of that likely stemmed from her being the daughter of a top coordinator. If Dawn were to keep relying on her mother's comfort, she would never improve as a coordinator. This acts as a turning point for Dawn's character, as she begins to spend more time training with her Pokemon and perfecting their skills for contests. She even takes after Ash a bit in this regard, and speaking of which, Ash and Dawn were constantly influencing each other. Dawn began adapting Ash's training habits to her contests, and Ash was able to use some of Dawn's contest moves as strategies in battle, such as with Bleasel's Ice Aqua Jet. This could also be a result of Ash actually watching all of Dawn's contests, 
as opposed to Maze, where he often skipped them to train on his own. Dawn may not have had as notable of a character shift as, say, May or Serena, but her skills as a coordinator kept getting more and more refined as the series went on, leading to her being the runner-up at the Grand Festival. However, Dawn wasn't the only one of Ash's friends to go through some major character growth. A lot of people seem to think Brock's presence in DP was stale or unnecessary, but I highly disagree, and it's not because he's my favorite character. If anything, I'd venture to say Brock had a more significant role in DP than he did in any other series, mostly because there are so many instances that foreshadow his eventual decision to become a Pokemon doctor. In one of my favorite episodes, Doc Brock, Brock leaves the group in Ash and Dawn's care to go stock up on supplies. Both of them have a lot of trouble taking care of their Pokemon, to the point where Pachirisu gets sick. When Brock returns, he shows Ash and Dawn how to properly care for sick Pokemon, which is one of many episodes foreshadowing his decision to become a Pokemon doctor. Brock is also shown helping several Nurse Joys care for Pokemon after particularly rough battles. One instance that sticks out to me is after Ash and Paul's intense battle at Lake Acuity. Like the previous seasons, not only is Brock the responsible caretaker of the group, but he's also the voice of reason within the group. He especially aids in breaking down the very complex battle strategies and major battles, especially the ones between Ash and Paul. Speaking of which, it's also worth mentioning that Brock is one of the few characters Paul actually respects, which kind of says a lot. He very much plays more of a mentor role in DP, even mentoring minor characters like Autumn or Marilyn in their questionable approaches to Pokemon. Brock is such an important part of this series that he even plays a big role alongside Ash and Dawn in the Team Galactic arc with his spiritual connection to Yuxi, who so fittingly is the bringer of knowledge. I was so glad to see that. DP Brock wasn't just all work and no play though, he participated in a lot of fun events alongside Ash and Dawn. To name just a few, he entered the Krogunk Festival and Dress Up Contest, he was a student in Professor Rowan's Summer Camp Academy, and of course he was a semi-finalist in the Heart Home Tag Battle Tournament. Now that we've gone over the main trio of this series, let's talk about their Pokemon, because that's another fantastic element of this series. First, there's Ash's team. Without question, this is one of the best teams he's ever had. Whether they won or lost, these Pokemon were all memorable in their own way. We got Staraptor, one of the coolest birds around, Torterra who kinda sucked, but at least as a Turtwig it was great thanks to its speedy battle style, the badass shonen type Buizel that got traded for Apom, the goofy and lovable Gliscor that really matured into a great air battler, the hilarious Gibble and his Draco Meteor, and last but certainly not least, Infernape. Hands down, one of Ash's all time greatest Pokemon in not just strength, but also one of the best in terms of development and character arc. More on that later though. Now it's not just Ash's Pokemon that really make the series stand out, what's amazing about the Diamond and Pearl series is that the companion Pokemon are also really memorable in their own right. With Dawn we have the amazing Piplup, although he can be kinda bratty at times, he's definitely the companion Pokemon with the most personality. Then there's Baneri who simps over Pikachu, the energetic Pachirisu, the tough Mamoswine that went through a similar obediency arc as Ash's Charizard, Ambipom who was perfectly set up for contests, we'll talk about the release later, Cyndaquil, the Heart Gold Soul Silver promotion, and Togekiss that was just kinda handed to her last minute. Ok, so the last few weren't the best examples, but they're still pretty memorable Pokemon. Also, it's worth mentioning that Dawn was the first companion and only companion until Go to have a full team, so that's pretty awesome. Then there's Brock's Pokemon, and even they were memorable. We got Sudowoodo who evolved from the baby Bonsly that Brock brought over from AG. Krogunk who would just not give Brock a break when it comes to the ladies, and the insanely overpowered Happiny that perfectly fits Brock's new Pokemon Dr. Goal. All of them, every single Pokemon that's part of the main cast really added to the enjoyment of the Diamond and Pearl series, as they should since the Pokemon anime is about the Pokemon after all. And now that we've gone over them, time to talk about the times they've been the most useful. When thinking back to the Diamond and Pearl series, the incredible battles and contests always come to mind. While the gym structure itself wasn't much different, battles had some of the coolest strategies in play up until this point. Ash vs Volkner is an especially standout battle, as Ash not only had to convince Volkner to actually keep participating in battles, but this was also where Infernape finally mastered Blaze. And speaking of Infernape, the Heart Home Tag Battle has to be one of the show's best non-league tournament arcs. During this tournament, contestants were paired up with a partner who they would have to battle alongside. And of course, Ash was paired up with Paul of all people. As you could imagine, the two are really out of touch when it comes to working together. But what really sets this arc apart is that they really don't become more in sync over time. In fact, the opposite is true, as the two's training styles clash here more than ever, which is extremely notable when Ash takes in Paul's recently released Chimchar. Contests, on the other hand, received a major glow up from the advanced generation. Visually speaking, they were played up as a much bigger deal, 
with characters often dressing up and using ball capsules to give their Pokemon flashy entrances. And we even got to see Dawn and Mei meet during the Wallace Cup, where they would battle it out in the finals. Dawn was sort of in a depressive state at the time, due to a losing streak, but managing to defeat Mei helped her overcome it. It was kind of weird to see Dawn win, as she definitely had much less experience than Mei, but it certainly posed her as a talented coordinator. And speaking of being a talented coordinator, the Grand Festival did a great job showing off everything Dawn had learned while on her journey. While she did lose to Zoe in the end, it was definitely close, and demonstrated just how close Dawn was getting to her dream. But the real question is, how does this stack up to the Sinnoh League? Man, I am just nailing these transitions. In a surprising twist, Ash decided to bring back a ton of his past Pokémon for the event. We got to see Cyndaquil evolve into Quillava, Sceptile take down Darkrai, and of course, the return of a very handsome Noctowl. It also didn't feel like Ash's Sinnoh Pokemon got shafted, as he exclusively used them in his fight against Paul, which many still consider to be the best battle in the entire anime. I know I do. Sorry, Ash vs. Kakui. Sure, the ending with Tobias was a bit disappointing, but this arc just showed how strong Ash has become. Before Best Wishes came along, that is. Despite the endless formulaic filler that plagued most of DP, I'm here to state the good things about Team Rocket. This series really fleshes out Jesse and James' backstories, the infamous Jezebel returns, and we're even introduced to a new character from Jesse's past. Jesse herself probably had the most development out of the trio in this series, as her decision to start doing contests came in full force. Unlike AG, I thought it was cool that she disguised herself as just one character this time, Jessalina, and kind of developed her own fan base. While Dawn and her rivals often had very cute or cool looking appeals and combinations, Jessalina's battle style was really unique and different. It was so awesome to get episodes where Jesse won ribbons, to the point where she actually got to be a major rival in the Grand Festival and was among the top 4 finalists. DP was also home to one of Jesse and James' best Pokemon teams. I know most of these Pokemon were caught during AG, but it feels like they actually did stuff in this series. Ganmega, Carnivine, Mime Jr., Dustox, Viper, Wobbuffet, and Meowth, of course, made solid contributions to major moments in the series. I loved how Jesse and James borrowed each other's Pokemon for contests and even the Poke Ringer tournament. One of my favorite episodes is the one where Jesse gets sick and James takes over for her by disguising himself as Jessalina and he actually wins the ribbon for her. Aside from contests and general trio shenanigans though, Team Rocket played a solid role in the Galactic Arc as well. They initially assisted in stealing the Adamant Orb from the Eterna Museum, and then with eventually realizing how much Team Galactic's evil plans could affect the fate of the universe, they went undercover as Galactic Grunts and helped Looker in his investigation. As far as other Team Rocket characters go, I wish we could have seen Giovanni play more of a role, but it was nice to see Biff and Cassidy, uh, I'm sorry, Butch and Cassidy, come back for an episode, even though it was kind of dumb and probably my least favorite out of their appearances. Anyway, let's shift our focus to the other evil team of the series. The Team Galactic arc, in my opinion, is one of the best villain arcs in the entire anime, trailing just behind the seemingly untouchable Flare arc. It was a drastic upgrade from the boring and quite frankly disappointing Aqua and Magma arc. The Galactic arc, however, not only had solid buildup, but also had an awesome and compelling payoff. Hunter J was a ruthless villain, often taking drastic measures to get what she wanted. Heck, even in the real two-parter, she literally had her Salamence burn forest to the ground with its flamethrower, putting innocent wild Pokemon in danger. We'd never seen anything like this before, aside from the typical movie villain or Pokemon poacher, so it was actually refreshing to see a consistent villain be such a threat. Inconsistency is right. From the beginning of DP, Jay, Cyrus, the Legendaries, and the rest of Team Galactic had frequent appearances and many smaller missions building up to the actual arc involving the Creation Trio and Lake Trio. The writers did a great job showing Cyrus's obsessive downward spiral, leading him to perish in the new world the Legends created. And honestly, the events that happened in this series were pretty consistent with the events in the actual games. Something I loved about this arc, which set it apart from previous villain arcs, was that Ash, Dawn, and Brock were equally and significantly involved in the plot, with their connections to Azelf, Mesprit, and Yuxi respectively. These connections were intertwined with other major events in the series, including Dawn's first day as a trainer, the Wallace Cup, and even right after Ash and Paul's battle at Lake Acuity. Although DP's pacing was a bit… off at times, its storytelling and continuity were woven together pretty seamlessly. In addition to Ash, Dawn, and Brock, I also love that so many other characters were involved in saving the day. 
Looker, Cynthia, Professor Rowan, Gary, and even Team Rocket had a big part to play, as I mentioned before. Also, can we talk about how Gary pretty much watched Jay and her team go down in the lake as their ship exploded? And they say the show is for kids. Throughout the course of the anime, there's been some amazing, memorable rivals. But there's also been quite a few duds. Diamond and Pearl introduced the most rivals for one series up until that point, for both Ash and Don. And as a whole, I'd say the quality was pretty consistent across the board. Of course, Paul was Ash's main rival, but Barry was certainly a worthy secondary. He more or less acts exactly how he does in the games, always having high energy and low patience. I'm just wondering if anyone ever paid their fines. One rival introduced early on, however, was Nando, who was unique as he served as a rival to both Ash and Don. Nando was split between gym battles and contests, so he just decided to go for both. While he was definitely more of a coordinator than a battler, he was able to make it to the Sinnoh League as well as the Grand Festival, always remaining calm and collected, even that one time he was framed for a crime. Ash also had a minor rivalry with Conway, but we really didn't get to see him much, which was a real shame, because he was one of the funniest characters Pokemon ever created, even if he's basically a glorified stalker. As for Dawn, her main rival was undeniably Zoe, who always seemed to be one step ahead of her. Their rivalry was definitely on the friendlier side though, with both happy to give the other a hand when it came to training. One moment that stuck out was when they first met at the Jubilife contest, and Zoe told Dawn that she'd see her in the finals. While this didn't happen at the Jubilife contest, this one line foreshadows the two's final match at the Grand Festival. And while Zoe still won the match, Dawn was certainly a lot closer to her level than when she started. As for Dawn's other rivals, Kenny was a childhood friend who shared the same dream. He wasn't the most memorable character out there, but as the childhood friend cliche goes, he did have a crush on Dawn. She rejected him. Lastly, there's Ursula, the mean one. She was introduced fairly late into the series, but served to push Dawn to her absolute limit. She learned about Dawn's fear of Plusle and Minun thanks to a childhood incident, and did everything she could to take advantage of that. But in the end, this was actually what helped Dawn get over her fear. Oh, and you could also count Jessalina as a rival, but no. Alright, so you might have noticed how Paul was kinda glossed over a bit, and that's cause we saved the best for last. As Ash's main rival of the series, he was done extremely well, and is one of the best things about this series. One of the problems with AG is that Ash didn't really have any major rivals, and that might be due to the fact that the writers simply didn't know how to give an experienced Ash a good rival yet. Well, it looks like Diamond and Pearl found the solution with Paul. What makes him work so well is that not only was he a jerk rival that we wanted to see Ash beat, but he also challenges Ash's views and ideals when it comes to raising his Pokemon. For the longest time, Ash has stuck with the same mentality, that with enough training and support, any Pokemon can be strong. But here comes Paul who's the complete opposite and only cares about a Pokemon's raw strength. This always caused the two to clash because Paul constantly puts Ash down for his training methods. What makes this rivalry even better is the fact that Paul is confirmed to have traveled and competed in the same leagues as Ash. So not only does he have a different viewpoint, but he also has just as much experience as Ash. It's not like he just started his journey and is suddenly cocky for no reason. <coughs> Trip. Unlike Gary who constantly teased Ash, his rivalry with Paul is a lot more personal because it's all about Ash trying to prove his beliefs. So when he loses to Paul, it hurts. We see this in their battle at Lake Acuity. Paul not only destroys Ash's team, but absolutely destroys his spirit. Now as good of a rival as Paul is, what truly made this rivalry was the final ingredient, Chimchar. It's a Pokemon with immense power thanks to its blaze ability, but Paul could never bring out its true potential so he gave up on it. However, Ash didn't give up on Chimchar, and with his training style, he was not only able to fully evolve it into Infernape, but also master the powerful blaze that Paul was originally trying to bring out. The rivalry all depended on Chimchar, because if Ash failed with it, that would mean that Paul was right all along. That's why their final battle in the Sinnoh League is often regarded as one of the best battles in the entire anime. It wasn't just another rival battle, it was a battle with a lot of personal stakes in it for both Ash and Infernape. And on top of that, it's a battle and rivalry that was built up very well since the very beginning of the series. And that brings us to the final and most important positive element. The best thing about Diamond and Pearl is the fact that for the most part, this series knew where they wanted to go from the beginning. They had a general plan and direction. The most important arc in Diamond and Pearl is Ash and Paul's rivalry. The reason it was pulled off so well was the fact that this was a plan for the series all along. Whether Ash won or lost the Sinnoh League, the end goal for Diamond and Pearl was always going to be that final battle between Ash and Paul. Since his debut in Episode 2, Paul has had a huge influence on Ash, and even when he's not there, he still manages to leave an impact. Everything Ash does in this series is not only to win the Sinnoh League, but more importantly, to defeat Paul. So when we finally reach that moment at the end of the series, after the constant battles, encounters, and conflicts, it's extremely satisfying as the anime accomplished what it set out to do. 
It's not just about Ash and Paul though, Dawn and even Brock get general direction as well. From the moment we meet Zoe, she says she wants to face Dawn in the finals. And what do you know, they actually do that in the Grand Festival. That's the overall goal the series was trying to reach with Dawn's character. There's also Ash's aim palm that was always destined to be with Dawn from the beginning, until it wasn't. And as for Brock, although not as obvious, his goal shift into becoming a Pokemon doctor was actually set up pretty nicely with him getting lots of doctor moments sprinkled throughout the series. Almost like the anime knew this would be Brock's final outing, so they wanted to slowly set up his reason to leave. Then there's our main character's connection with the Lake Trio. This was teased back in the very first episode, and as the series continued, we would slowly see it build up to the Team Galactic arc. Nothing really feels random in this series. For the most part, everything seems well thought out. I said for the most part. In my opinion, this is what makes for a really good series, when they have something planned out from the beginning and successfully executed. And that wraps up all of the positive points about the Diamond and Pearl series. Now although this series gets a lot of praise, it still has its downsides. So let's get into that. Ash, his companions, and even Team Rocket had pretty solid teams of Pokemon throughout the series, but there's a few that sadly fell through the cracks due to unnecessary releases and just bad writing. Let's take a look at some of these disrespected Mons. What started out as a touching story of Cacnea joining the team in AG after Arbok and Weezing were released eventually turned into this. During James and Gardenia's tag battle against Ash and Dawn, Gardenia sees Cacnea's potential and suggests that James leave it in her care to learn Drain Punch. James lets his insecurities as a trainer get the best of him, which influences his decision to leave Cacnea with Gardenia. Really, James? I mean, it's nice to see that James is thinking about what's best for his Pokemon, but this excuse to give it away just comes out of nowhere. It's just sad to see Pokemon time and time again either get released or be given to minor characters never to be seen or heard from again. Which leads me to yet another similar situation, and this one was a real heartbreaker. Jesse's Dustox. Dustox was not only a frequent participant in Jesse's contest in Hoenn, but was also instrumental in winning Jesse her first contest ribbon in DP. Jesse also had a really strong bond with Dustox, more so than any of her other Pokemon, I dare to say, which is why fans felt so cheated and sad when she released it after so many fond memories together. This was pretty much bye bye Butterfree all over again. While it was a real tearjerker of an episode, I just find it frustrating when Pokemon are carried over from the previous region only to be replaced halfway through as if they were nothing. Hadn't we suffered enough with Arbok and Weezing's release? Anyway, that's enough for the Rocket Mons. And now on to Ash's Torterra. Oh boy. What really disappoints me about Torterra was the interesting buildup that kind of went nowhere. It's a shame because I love the Turtwig line in general, and I was so excited to see it progress during Ash's journey, especially since it was one of his earliest Sinnoh captures. But after evolving, poor thing just never seemed to win a major battle. Looking back at its five gym battles it was in, I can't believe Torterra's defining achievement was helping Ash win his first two gym badges. As a Turtwig, while I personally loved the relationship it had with Paul's Torterra, it's a shame all of that fell flat when it didn't really accomplish much in the later episodes. Finally, before our friend Zack gets to the biggest contender, we have Gliscor. Gliscor was also another one on Ash's team that had such potential and a great personality, but similar to Gengar and Dragonite in Journeys, it wasn't used very much. He got somewhat of a redemption being used in Ash's Sinnoh League battle against Paul, but that's about it. Alright, now when it comes to disrespected Pokemon, we save the best for last, or more like the worst, Ambipom. So as mentioned earlier, Ash's Apom was a Pokemon that was perfectly set up for contests thanks to seeing May compete in the Kanto Grand Festival back in AG. We would then see its interest in contests be further developed during the beginning of Ash's Sinnoh journey. So when it's time for Ash and Dawn to trade, it's actually done really well because it makes sense. You know what doesn't make sense? Releasing it to play Ping Pong. Like what the actual f*** Diamond and Pearl? I get that maybe you wanted to make space for some of Dawn's new team members, and honestly it wouldn't even be that bad if it was a Pokemon like Pachirisu or even Buneary. But Ambipom? One of the most well-developed Pokemon? For a Cyndaquil with zero personality and an underdeveloped Togekiss? I seriously want to know what was going through the anime staff's head when deciding this. Like you've literally spent all this time setting up this Pokemon story arc only to throw it out the window in the dumbest way possible. And to add insult to injury, they made Ambipom lose in its last contest ever in the episode prior. It doesn't get any more disrespectful than that. This was straight up character assassination. I honestly hate that this happens so much and it'll always be one of the worst things about Diamond and Pearl. Aside from disrespected Pokemon, the DP writers really dropped the ball on two potentially great captures for Ash's Sinnoh team. The episode Mass Hipposis seemed to be a clear setup for Ash to catch a Hippopotas after saving it from being stranded on a steep cliff. 
You'd think after a wild goose chase to rescue it from Team Rocket's clutches, Ash would have caught it, but nope. This episode actually turns out to be pretty pointless, with Ash determined to return Hippopotas back to its herd. And to add salt to the wound, this Hippopotas actually returns later in the Biff and Cassidy episode, but they still don't give it to Ash. So what was the point? The second episode is probably the worst offender of the two. Riolu and Lucario fans alike got lucky this year with Ash catching a Riolu in Pokemon Journeys, but imagine if Ash had caught a Riolu early on, especially in its native region. The special aura sphere-wielding Riolu, featured in the two-parter Pokemon Ranger and the Kidnapped Riolu, developed a really strong connection with Ash, especially after learning that Ash shared the same aura ability. This special not only showed continuity from Lucario and the Mystery of Mew, but also introduced an interesting side quest for Hunter J in wanting to capture the Riolu. Too bad Ash and Riolu's bond was all for nothing, as Riolu decides to stay with the breeder who originally raised it. <sighs> Man, whether you think Ash having Lucario is overhyped or not, you gotta admit, this was still frustrating. At least we have the one from Pokemon Journeys, so I guess it was worth the wait after all. Oxford Dictionary defines the word filler as a thing put in space or container to fill it. Wait, wrong one. A person or thing that fills a space or container. Dang it, that's not it either. Oh, here we are. Filler is a good 40% of the Diamond and Pearl series. The series follows both Ash and Dawn's journeys, which in theory should take the same length as the Advanced Generation. The difference, however, is that Advanced Generation wrapped all that up in its third season, and the fourth was sort of an extra adventure. Diamond and Pearl honestly could have just been three seasons. Or, if they did need a fourth, they could have added some kind of extra story, perhaps something involving the Battle Zone. We didn't even see the Battle Zone until Pokemon Journeys, ten seasons later. What's up with that? The show's pacing had a tendency to be really inconsistent. There's often gaps of 20 to 30 episodes between gym battles. Sure, they could fill that time with a contest or villain arc, but most of the episodes involve our heroes meeting a character of the day, solving their problem, and then never seeing them again. Oh, and Team Rocket always squeezes their way in. Maybe if we're lucky someone could learn a move or something, but too many times, episodes just feel pointless. Also, for a season literally called Galactic Battles, there was surprisingly little Team Galactic to be found. This is also where we began the infamous one-year gap between Ash's 7th and 8th gym battles. Sure, there was a lot going on within that year, like the return of Brandon, Ash and Paul's Lake Acuity battle, and even the Twinleaf Festival, but you can really tell at times that they were just dragging the story out. They even gave Dawn another losing streak, just to buy some time until the Grand Festival started. But once it does, the pacing picks up tremendously, with the Grand Festival leading right into Ash vs. Volkner, which is soon followed by the Sinnoh League. However, it felt like for every meaningful episode, there was one about a group of Psyduck that just refused to move. Like, this was one of the game's roadblocks, but I don't think it needed to be made into a full-length episode. Going back to that one-year gap, however, Although it did have a lot going on, we still have to mention the weakest part of it. And in our opinion, it's the Heart Gold and Soul Silver arc. To help promote the release of these games, Pokemon aired a five-part arc in which our heroes meet two characters from Johto, Lyra and Cory. Now this arc actually has a pretty cool start, with Don receiving a Cyndaquil egg from Lyra, and Cory revealing that he wants to be a Pokemon breeder, leading Brock to become a sort of mentor figure to him. However, everything starts to go downhill when the two become temporary travel companions. The more we saw of Lyra in particular, the more annoying she got. She was basically an in-canon shipper, her defining goal as a character basically resorted to making Cory more confident, and for some reason, she always called Dawn Dane. Actually, let's touch upon that, because it made no sense to me back in the day. In the Japanese version, she calls Dawn Hikarin, which is her Japanese name, Hikari, only with an N sound at the end. In Japanese, adding an N sound to a name can be seen as a cute nickname, but my god did that get lost in translation. One moment that perfectly sums up Lyra's character is a scene in which the gang has to share 7 cookies among the 5 of them. Cory does the math and determines that everyone should get 1.4 cookies, but then Lyra basically says screw it and grabs 2. Like I said, she's just so annoying. Cory, on the other hand, was definitely more bearable, and I actually quite liked him acting as Brock's student. However, the whole arc seems to focus on his confidence issues. He's definitely more of a thinker than a doer, similar to how Go was in the beginning of Pokemon Journeys. However, this character arc just feels kind of out of place, especially since they only had five episodes to develop him. The episode where Cory sees the most growth is when he catches a Gibble. The episode plays it out as if Ash is going to be the one to catch Gibble, but then Cory swoops in and catches it for himself. 
I get the intention here, to show Cory's development by having him catch a strong Pokemon, but then Ash catches his own Gibble 12 episodes later. You see why I find this arc pointless? It ends with Don competing in the lily pad contest, with Lyra and Cory not really serving much of a point to being there. And then they fly back to Johto after getting their butts kicked by Ash and Don. This definitely wasn't the worst arc Pokemon had, but it was just dull and kind of pointless. And for how good HeartGold and SoulSilver were, they definitely deserve better. You know what else deserved better? The ending. As much as I love Diamond and Pearl, I myself will admit that the way they ended the story, specifically for Ash and Dawn, was not the best. I'll start with Dawn, as it isn't as bad, but honestly, she should have won the Grand Festival. They took her all the way to the Grand Festival Finals and made her face off against her main rival, Zoe. Because Dawn never beaten Zoe before, this would have been the perfect moment to do so. But they didn't because I guess main characters aren't allowed to reach their goals or whatever. There's also the really weird excuse they give for her not being able to travel with Ash anymore. Dawn was so ready to go to Kanto with Ash, but she doesn't because she gets a last minute call from that fashion lady from that one random episode because they wanted Baneri to be a model for them or, or something, I don't know man. Excuse me? They could have honestly given a better excuse, like maybe Dawn wanted to do contests in Hoenn or Johto. Not this random modeling crap. It's never even mentioned how that went in her return in black and white, so that just shows how last minute and irrelevant this was. But nothing will be worse than the absolute disrespect Ash got. After having the best battle in the entire anime, Ash is then put up against the infamous Tobias. He was clearly created to prevent Ash from winning the league. He's the complete embodiment of the anime staff's stubbornness to not let Ash win. To the point that they even gave him legendaries to finish the job quickly. Yeah, it's cool to see Ash take down some legends, showing how strong he is, but is it really worth making him lose the Sinnoh League this badly? What makes it even worse is that the other guy who makes it to the finals did worse than Ash. So if Tobias never existed, Ash pretty much would have been able to win the league. All this did was soil the ending to Ash's Sinnoh region run. A four year journey gone to waste after a single episode. You really hate to see it. Alright, and that wraps up all the major elements of Diamond and Pearl. Now it's time for the final verdict of the series. And after rewatching every single episode, I can ultimately say that Diamond and Pearl is in fact a great series. Shocker, I know. Now obviously, it's not a perfect series, especially since we just pointed out its flaws. But honestly, I think Animated Ginger put it best in his series ranking video when he said that Diamond and Pearl feels like the definitive Pokemon anime. It follows the same structure that was introduced in the original series, but does the absolute best with it. Yes, it has its pacing issues when it comes to filler, and I will tip my hat to AG for doing a better job when it comes to that, but what series doesn't have its fair share of boring filler? Other than that, for the most part, Diamond and Pearl excels at everything else. The gym battles are much better, the contests are better, the league was the best of them all at this point, we get lots more development and training episodes for both Ash and Dawn, and this series did a better job at treating our main characters as equals. Yeah go, it's cool that you're a double protagonist and all, but Dawn was kinda the OG at that. We even get a successfully executed evil team arc that the series built up pretty well. And of course the biggest highlight is Ash's main rivalry with Paul, an element that was missing in AG unfortunately. Afterwards, we get Black and White where they attempt a soft reboot, then we get series like XY, Sun and Moon, and Journeys that all do things a bit differently to shake up the formula. Because of this, the anime hasn't really felt the same since then. Now I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but just that Diamond and Pearl is the last to stay true to what the Pokemon anime was originally meant to be. In our opinion, it was the one to perfect the formula that was introduced in the original series, and even feels like a conclusion to the first era of the Pokemon anime. And that's why we believe the Diamond and Pearl anime is a great Pokemon series. It's a pretty pog one if I do say so myself. Thanks everyone for watching my review of the Diamond and Pearl anime. And special thanks to Animated Ginger and Polly for joining me. Also, shout out to Silverstorm for this awesome cover of Psycho Every Day. Check them out if you haven't already. Last but not least, make sure to live your life to the fullest, and I'll see you next week for my review of the black and white anime. Should be interesting.